It's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. <laughs> Harlan Krumholz, the Harold Hines Jr. Professor of Medicine and Director of the Yale New Haven Hospital Center for Outcomes Research and Yale Center for Research Computing Faculty Co-Director. In ad addition to being those directors, he's also the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at the Yale School of Medicine. His research focus is on, hey, on, is on improving patient outcomes, <laughs> health performance, <laughs> and population health. Thank you. Welcome, Harlan Crummels. I'm sorry, because I know, I, I know how long he spent working on that introduction. But I, you can post it online. Uh, create the change for for society and science so and and also to do it so generously right so everything you heard from Brian is about uh, you know this is whiteboarded I mean you can put your own insignia on you can put this I mean it's not about what he's doing for promoting himself or his center but it's about creating the capabilities and then and, you know then Aaron comes along and uh, you know I, I just uh, have never seen so much uh, really courage and uh, in someone of that position because it's easy uh, when you've got tenure or it's easy at some points in your career where you're in a secure position to be espousing what are the right things to do. It's another thing when you are in exactly the position that makes it difficult to do the right thing because all the forces around you are telling you you're not going to get credit uh, you know, because this is about your credit. This is a time of your life to be selfish. This is a time of life you've got to worry about yourself in terms of what you're going to be credited with because that's the way the career path goes. And to, you know, to have that voice, I think that's what makes your voice so powerful because it shames us all, really, in a way, because it makes us realize, like, well, what have we created as an ecosystem that, that says to people that they have to worry that if they do the right thing for society, if they do the right thing in thinking about where science needs to go, that they potentially jeopardize uh, their own positions. And instead of thinking, again, it generously, that if we all work together in common cause, uh, that in, and our contributions, yeah, there will need to be some understanding of what the, those contributions are. But we don't have to feel that uh, we have to hold tight our data and our work and, and do it to the detriment of the progress that needs to be made as a society. So, I just salute you for, for all of that, and uh, I think that it, it's humbling. And then, of course, my co-director, co uh, Ice Case, showing uh, all these amazing things about the universe. And, you know, I, I, I want to be an astrophysicist because it just, I just want to be able to show that stuff and say, you see this box here? This box represents the whole universe. And, and, and this is what it was, and then these clumps, you see, that's what the universe is now. It's like, I, I, some, when I come, in my second life, I want to come back if I had the ability to be able to do that. But... So this talk is a, a, a sort of a basic orientation to at least what some of what my own journey was and what I think is important as we think about this issue of data sharing. And I'd like to enlist your thinking about how do we actually uh, achieve what, what we want. Now, I, I do want to uh, I have some potential conflicts. Are we posting these slides? No, but I, we'll post them somewhere. I, you know, this is where a thing like you go like this. And I have some potential conflicts of interest. So then. <laughs> So these are the grants, and uh, there's some, I'm on a scientific advisor for United Healthcare, and I founded a company that's trying to enable people to acquire their health-related data and to move it, and we'll put this up somewhere for people to see. But uh, I, I want to just get to some terminology, because people get a little confused when we're talking about these issues. And I'm just very, this is just very simple, based. That's, that's the only way I can really understand it, which is we're often talking about reporting. When we're talking about reporting, the question is, you've done something, have you told anybody about it? And the one situation I'm most interested in, I'm, as a, I'm a cardiologist, I'm a physician, is somebody's performed experiments on people. Have they told anyone what they found? 
So there's this issue of selective reporting, but there's also an issue of who paid for it and was there any return on that. But then there's the most important issue, which is you put some people at risk or involve them and have you told, this is the very basic thing. Has anyone just know what you did? Then the publication is sort of the next level. Is it available anywhere more broadly? Has it been subjected to peer review? And I think peer, preprints are a form of peer review also. I mean, has it been, is it out there? And then there's this issue of sharing, which is, are you willing to let people take a look at the data and come to their own conclusions? And then Brian's bringing up this other issue, which I think is really important that I've never even listed on my slide because it's, for us it's always been so far along, but it, it's really, do, are you willing to share the workflow, the underlying stuff that led to the data that you're sharing? So for example, in our field, you know, there may be that there's raw data that needs to be adjudicated that ends up in being one of the data fields in the final data set, but there's, there's work underneath that that actually might, you know, be somewhat discretionary. It might not be just black and white, and, and that often is beyond the view. Now, sometimes the FDA or others get that data, and, through, and I'm going to talk about some of that uh, through litigation, but, but that's also another tier here, which is, is that in. So my own journey about this began when I, I got involved in the Vioxx litigation. I have to admit I was like totally oblivious to what was going on with Vioxx. And some lawyers showed up to talk to me, and, and I'd never been involved in any legal cases before. And at first it was like, I, you know, I really am not that interested in talking about this issue, and, and I was busy enough, and, and it didn't seem like, you know, it was going to be worth it. So I, let's take this off. So, um, but then they started prevailing, they, they, what they convinced me about, you know, this thing doesn't come off. You ever make a fool of yourself when you're in front of all these people? All right, this thing's just going to go like that. <laughs> so, so they, they, what they started, the reason they prevailed on me, so the issue was Vioxx was a drug that was to treat, uh, it was like, it was a second generation non-steroidal. It's COX-2 inhibitor. It's like uh, Celebrex, Vioxx. These were drugs that were meant to be safer on the stomach and to have the same benefit for, for example, joint pain. And um, the thing was, they, they told me that what they had were all the internal emails and communications and data that was available within Merck that had never been shared externally. And all of a sudden, I mean, I never really even thought about it before, but it, it, it kind of got me interested. And I said, well, I'll get involved if you promise me everything I touch can go into the public domain. Because I don't think that there's a wide appreciation about the way science is conducted. And, and I think that there'd be something to learn here. So I decided to get involved with this for that reason. And, um, and then, you know, we started seeing emails like this. I'll read it to you because I know you can't quite see it. But, but this email says, memo re regarding changes to the Lane manuscript. By the way, this guy's a faculty member here now. But he was at UCLA then. But it, this is Merck discussing this guy's manuscript. And I'm OK with the first two points. However, for point three, we can either say this is 52% or 52% and give the numbers that you have in the table, it's a matter of emphasis. I'm trying to give this the best face possible that's compatible with the truth of the data. Now, I, I, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying they were, they were gonna lie, or I'm not saying that they were gonna corrupt the data, but this is a very important exchange because it reveals something uh, that's actually, I believe, universal. I'm trying to give this the best face possible that's compatible with the truth, quote unquote, of the data. And I, I was telling Brian when we were meeting before, when I first started on Vioxx, I, started, I, I was really starting to get upset with industry. I said, well, God, this is an industry issue. But the deeper I got into it, I realized that this is a cultural issue within science. These people were sure they knew what the truth was and were trying to understand how they could best present their data to be compatible with that truth. One can emphasize what one wants. It's not clear from a clinical perspective what any of this means for erosions, these are the ulcers in the stomach, so why not try for somewhat better appearing message? And for point two, as Ned and I were in agreement, I would push back on this one. I'm, I'm surprised that GI adverse events in a three month trial would not be of interest to practicing gastroenterologists. Why not try to take that out? But I'm actually not using this to impugn Merck or even this faculty member who was Tape to say, I'm glad to say whatever, you know, I said whatever Merck would say. He was caught off camera saying that. But the, what I'm saying is this is a universal truth within science. 
People have strong feelings about what they want. They're trying to be compatible with the truth, but there are multiple interpretations. And what I was sort of discovering was that these guys were, were just articulating. We were able to see sort of emails that you wouldn't normally see. And then you would see emails like this. They're talking about an, an adjudication and a protocol. So they're getting the records and they're looking at them. In this case, they were sort of unblinded actually to the results. And they said, I, at this point, I think it's too late to reverse what's been done. Deborah said to, that you told her to count this as an MI. I don't think the adjudication committee would have counted this as an MI, blah, blah, blah. I would prefer unknown cause of death so that we don't raise concerns. Now, again, I'm, gonna, I'm just saying, this is Merck saying they had some, uh, the committee said this is a heart attack. The concern was Vioxx was causing heart attacks. This is in the Vioxx arm. They're saying like, you know, maybe we should call it unknown. It's a little bit on the edge of what it is. Assume for a minute they're right or wrong. I'm just showing you that there's tremendous amount of discretion at various points. We're used to seeing papers as sort of monolithic, pristine, written in stone, scientific contributions. And, and what it's not telling you is the underlying uncertainty around almost every aspect of that paper. Now, it, I'm not saying that in the end you wouldn't get consensus around a lot of papers. But I'm also seeing a lot of papers, and Brian's shown this very well, if given to different groups, are going to come to different conclusions. In some ways, predicated on their own cognitive bias, their own beliefs. And, it, and it's not an, an evil, not evil situation. I mean, in this case, the, the cognitive bias can be strong because there's also a strong profit motive. But it's not just the profit motive. You're not going to get promoted at that time in Merck for raising questions about a, a a $10 billion a year drug. You know, you're not going to, or, or $10 billion over five years drug. You're not going to get into trouble. You're, gonna get, you're not going to get promoted for that. In the same way, I'm not going to get promoted in an academic institution if I start writing papers that impugn my great theory for which I'm famous for and start saying, you know, all that stuff I've been saying for the last five years, I actually think it's not true. Right? And, and again, it's not maybe that you're sitting in your office saying, like, holy moly, I got to, like, you know, make this up, but the way your eyes are seeing the data, the way you're thinking about it, the framing that you're putting on it, is because of your deep set belief and now you think you know what the truth is. And so you're interpreting it in that way. This was an interesting figure that I saw which basically was looking at among the adjudicated events, what percent, this is now adjudicated heart attacks, what percent were uh, uh, confirmed? And it turned out that uh, um, they confirm, if, all things being equal, you would think they'd be confirmed equally likely in the Vioxx and the placebo group. But it turns out that the, the, the heart attacks are confirmed more often in the placebo group than they were. So what this means is someone says, I think there was a heart attack. Goes to the committee, the committee says, can you confirm this was a heart attack? Well, when you look at it, in the one group, it's confirmed a lot more often than the other group. It happens to be the group that favors the company's product because if you confirm heart attacks more commonly in the placebo group, means you're throwing away the ones that they're asking about more in the Vioxx group. Vioxx then has fewer heart attacks than you might expect otherwise. Now, again, there are many ways this can seep in, not just that someone at the top is writing an email memo, hey, make sure you favor Vioxx. There's lots of ways it gets communicated implicitly into a bias that, that occurs. So what we did was we wrote a series of papers based on our experience with, uh, with this that, that sort of taught us a bunch of stuff. So you know, we learned, by the way, we wrote a paper in JAMA about guest authorship and ghostwriting. And we, we discovered through these emails that there were a whole lot of papers out there that actually academics never wrote at all. And we had the contracts. We saw the money that was passed. Basically, they were given drafts. They put their name on it. I mean, and we listed them in this paper. And that made us very popular. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we, um, we just thought, you know, this was a case study that we got to see, you know, some of the underbelly of what was going on in, in terms of this. And we, we did another paper in Annals where we learned that some of the clinical trials that they do are called seeding trials. Have you ever heard of these? So the seeding trial is that they usually are close to release. And they said, how are we going to get lots of doctors uh, using this drug? They think they, already the FDA is on the thing. It's not a pivotal trial. It's not one the FDA is going to use for approval. And what they do is if you ever see a trial where 
it seems like they have a large number of sites and a relatively small number of people they're enrolling at each site. We saw the documents that this trial won an award in the marketing division at Merck because what their goal was was to get as many doctors as possible used to prescribing the drug just at the time it was going to be uh, sold. So they would go, if they can't even talk to the doctors before it's out. They can't begin to start detailing them. It's not available yet. But if I've now got a thousand practices, a thousand doctors, I can actually at that time fly you to a resort and give you days of lectures about the drug because you're now part of a trial. So I need to educate you about what you're going to be doing the trial on. And you're going to be writing, getting your patients on the drug because you're in the trial. And I can actually give you a lot of support for this, you know, and then you'll be listed in the authorship of a, some paper somewhere. So, you know, we, and like I said, the God of Marketing Award is a really brilliant thing. But this is another thing we learned. I, I know this has nothing to do with open science, but I just have to tell you, this was amazing. So the open science part about this was understanding the underlying infrastructure. What was the workflow of this? How did they pick those sites? What did they do, though? They picked people that they thought were opinion leaders and prescribers who would get that experience. We published in BMJ a paper, and this is what got us first thinking about the data sharing issue. So um, in the, you know, the Brits called learnt. What do we learn from Vioxx? But um, that, we didn't make that mistake. I just want to make sure everyone knows. <laughs> uh, so that there, this paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Comparison of upper gastrointestinal toxicity of rofecoxib, which is Vioxx, and naproxen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This is, a very, this is a very prominent study that was very important in talking about the use of Vioxx. And um, they, they had an issue where myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, were a little bit more common in the, in the um, Vioxx group. This was confirming this suspicion that Vioxx was going to be a problem for the heart. The, the writers write that the incidence of myocardial infarction was lower among lower among patients in the naproxen group. That's like a leave. You, you see their framing wasn't higher in the Vioxx group. It was lower in the naproxen group. But it was, um, the, the issue was that there was a borderline significance uh, about these cardiovascular harm. But it turned out when you actually looked at the data when in, in litigation, all the data became free, we were able to examine it. Remember, Vioxx is thought to be better for the stomach, worse for the heart. At the end of the study, they stopped counting uh, heart attacks before they stopped counting stomach events. So they kept counting the stomach events and, and they got to, it was safer for the stomach, but it, would, it was sort of borderline for the heart attack. So there were like three extra heart attacks in the Vioxx group that occurred within the study period, but they said it took, was gonna take them too long to, to, so they stopped three months earlier counting the heart attacks. You never would know that. Looking at actually New England Journal, uh, uh, eventually writes, an, I don't know why they didn't retract it, but they wrote what they called an expression of concern that, that this had not uh, been revealed at the time of doing it. But again, the, the only way you can figure this out, and they had a reason for it. I can't remember what the reason was something like, I can't remember. It was, it was a silly reason, but the, because there could be no reason for that. And, and uh, but anyway, they, they start doing it. And later on, you could see when when it was done the right way, the rofecoxib was, was much more harmful. Meanwhile, what happens is the company and, and a major academic, first author's an, an academic, produces a meta-analysis. They combine the data that's out there, but they're, Constam, uh, as a, I shouldn't, oh, it's up here. So, uh, is the first author. They're, everyone else basically pulled, is from Merck, and they pulled the, the meta-analysis together, and, um, we can see from the emails, they're the ones really putting it together. Marv does edit it. He's a responsible person. I think this is just what he saw. But they, they're selective in the trials that they do. Not all the trials were being reported. So they were able to say, here are the main trials you should be looking at for the meta-analysis. It just wasn't that way. And they end up saying, with, when you compare Vioxx, Rosicoxid to placebo, there's no, there, in fact, if anything, there might be a decreased risk. That's, that's the one, but they cherry picked the studies. So we uh, actually did a pooled analysis. Once we finished with the trial, we had the judge give us all the data on all the trials. And most of these had never been seen before because it had never been published. They, they had just 
put out the pivotal stuff, and I, this is where I did my friend Joe Ross. Joe was a fellow at this time. And um, we identified 30 randomized placebo-controlled trials with 20,000 subjects, 15 from osteoarthritis, six from rheumatoid arthritis, three is Alzheimer's, six others. Most of them were pretty short. Um, 18 were published uh, of the 30 before withdraw with the Vioxx withdrawal. So we start, um, we start looking at them, and we did this a cumulative meta-analysis. So we sort of start adding up you know, what happens if you bring in the, each trial given when it was finished. And you can see when you first start, you know, you've only got one trial that there's a 30% increase in risk, but it's not significant. And you start adding up. By the time you get to 2000, you've got about a 2x increase in risk, and it's 07. Um, by at, this is about the time that bigger trial comes out, that other one comes out, where the relative risk was 5. And you start adding. By 2001, you've got a significant result in 1.35. Now, you've done, I don't know whether a p-value, what it means at this point, but the point is that there's a, there's, a, there's an indication that there's a possibility that there's a risk that's becoming strong. The drug doesn't get withdrawn until 2004, but the public dialogue at this point is this is an absolutely safe drug. And their own meta-analysis is suggesting, if anything, it could be protective. And, and again, I'm not, I don't want to impugn the professional. I don't want to improve, impugn my colleague Marv Constam. I'm telling you that people start looking at it in a certain frame. I think the Merck people, many of them good people, you know, are thinking about this is no way this is a problem, or there somehow there's a cognitive dissonance. I got to be very careful around Bryant's using any of these psychology words, but he's kind enough not to correct me. But there's there's uh, there, there's something going on here that's leading to by the by the time you got to when the drug was withdrawn, I mean the signal's just getting stronger anyway as more cases are accumulating. But but this is what kind of got our group motivated in thinking that we've got a problem in the scientific enterprise. This lack of transparency, the, 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 the unwillingness to admit that whoever's doing the study might not be, have this a sort of a the corner on the interpretation of that study, that there may be more than one way to look at things and more than one way to interpret them, got us thinking that we've got a big problem here and this affects people's lives. I'm just going to say there were other studies like this where this was an RCT of Celecoxib. I'm sort of on the coxibs right now, but uh, that led to this study that was in JAMA that, that concluded that um, it, it was much lower incidence of ulcers, main outcome incidence of prospectively defined symptomatic upper GI ulcers and ulcer complications and other things. Uh, during the, this was their main outcome. We're better with, with, uh, with Celebrex. So this is what they showed in the JAMA paper. Look how much better Celebrex is. That's amazing. But it turned out they actually had the 12-month data too. And I don't know what happened to it. And the 12-month data it looks a lot less impressive. But, but they just had decided, why show a year? We got six months. You know, it's a. Uh... <laughs> so but, but again, this is about like this stuff can't happen if we're starting to share data, it's out there. I mean, there's not, nothing in it that's for anyone who's going to try to do it. And if someone did feel like six months was somehow telling you something important, let them make the case. But, but these are the kind of things that's come out. You may have seen this one more recently with Paxil. This was a study that was uh, uh, published more than a decade ago that was suggesting that Paxil was more effective in, in, um, uh, in reducing depressive symptoms. And they reported side effects, but they were basically saying uh, serious side effects occurred in, 11, uh, in, in the Paxil group, in, in Mipronine group 5, and 2 in the placebo group. But, but then there's this effort to say, let's, let's really take a second look at some of these trials. Recently, the BMJ publishes this thing, Restoring Study 329, Efficacy and Harms of uh, Proxetine and Mipronine uh, in Treatment of Major Depression in Adolescents. This study... Uh, ends up saying efficacy reanalysis according to the way that they did it doesn't look like it's any better, but it does look like it's associated with uh, suicidal and self-injury events. There's a lot of concern now that people were being prescribed Paxil, especially adolescents, to try to treat depression, but actually was raising the risk of suicidality. The, the, the point I'm making, and I don't want to get into the details of how this is, but it's just the point that different groups can see the same data, even trial data. What, I, what I've learned to discover is that people have this idea that it's so formula, formulaic 
in a trial that any, you can give anyone the same data and they're going to come up with the same answer. And any, any questioning of that is, again, sort of criticizing the integrity of the investigators. And I'm trying to take all of that out. I am not criticizing either those early or the late. I'm just suggesting the possibility that even well-intentioned people will come to different conclusions. And again, this is the, what Brian's showing time and time again now in the reproducibility studies. You don't have to think that it's about bad actors. I think the moment you worry about bad actors is when you begin to trivialize this problem. Because then it just becomes about the people who don't have good morals, the people who are are just seeking their own self-benefit. And if we can just identify those people and, and get them out, because it mean, it's just like racism. It's just like racism, I guess. Which is like, it, you know, let's get rid of the personalized racism, but we neglect the structural racism. You know, it's just like saying, because it, it can't be me. I can't be caught up in this, because I'm not like that. And just like racism, I'm not like that. But the truth is, we're talking about something that pervades the human experience, this cognitive bias in this case. The way in which people think about race and differences and tribalism in another case. You know, th these are things that we have to begin to say are not sequestered to a few bad actors, but in fact are affecting the entire scientific enterprise. And, it, and it's, I believe that the transparency, the willingness to be open, the sharing, is the most important treatment of that problem in science because it, it begins to open our minds to the idea. Now, I will tell you, on, on things like this, what I hear from people is, I don't want to share my data because there are people who disagree with me, who are, who are agenda-driven, who are going to take my data, and then they're going to do bad things with it. And what are the bad things? They're going to produce something that disagrees with me. What's implicit in that? I don't have an agenda. I don't have a point of view. I haven't done that same thing. And in my, my field, a lot of the people running trials are people who have a deep-seated belief in the value of a particular treatment. They, they wouldn't even be the head of the trial if they didn't, in their hearts, say, this could be something that could be successful for people. They're not, we, don't, we somehow don't have a machine where somebody thinks this is important. I want to find you who don't have an opinion about it to study it. We, we tend to find people studied who are enthusiasts. And that's what, by the way, gives them the energy to recruit the sites and bring people on board. And, and you know, there are lots of things about that. Then they, you know, go on a tour afterwards and tell people why it's a, such a success if it's successful. The companies who are paying for it want people like that. Not necessarily because they want people who are going to corrupt the trial, but they want someone who can cheerlead if this thing's positive. They want opinion leaders. They want people who actually are excited about this idea because they want the translation if they get the positive effect. But but what we have to begin to realize is we all have agendas. We all are, have a certain frames that we, in which we approach this. And we all need to find ways that are going to help us get to the right answer, what that truth might be, or the understanding that truth may be murkier than we would like to believe. Um, so, you know, we begin to look at this selective publication issue. I'm going I'm to now uh, 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 just pivot back to the reporting issue, for example, because I'm talking about data sharing, I actually, as I think about it, uh, I should have gotten to this part first, because even before you get to data sharing, the question is, are you telling anybody what you found? Because for people who are non-scientists, this becomes important, because if I'm the most conscientious physician, and when you come and see me, I, and you've got a problem, what I'm going to do is make sure I scour the literature to understand what's, what's good and bad about particular strategies for you. If people have systematically not put information in the literature, I'm going to have a biased view of what, what's known, right? Because what, there, a lot of what's known to some people is not being aired generally. And so I'm in a position of weakness with regard to being able to understand that. P people have been talking about this for a while, I don't know, for a while in my field, it's 1990, but Ian Chalmers starts writing about this issue about underreporting research. I'm, I think I'm going to go... Uh, this is, so one of, the, one of the ways that we sort of developed to try to at least even understand this problem was we started asking people, requiring people to register their, their trials. If they wanted to get published in a, particularly a high impact journal, you have to have been registered. So we could start to look at what percent of those that are registered and, and, and 
documented as completed. Let me just say that a lot of people will register. Who the heck knows if they complete it? They, they actually don't say. So assume that some of the people who'd never fill out that they completed the study actually did complete it. But, but if you're not going to publish it, I mean, they didn't go back on to clinicaltrials.gov to do that. This is what always amazes me. The people who actually took the time to go back on to clinicaltrials.gov and document that it's completed is a subset, right? It's a, you've shrunk the denominator because, the, I mean, the most egregious thing is I've done this experiment and I, I'm just done. Like, I, why am I even going to go back on the registration site to say that it was finished? I mean, I don't even know why people do that if they're not going to try to do something with it. But if you look at the completed, your, your rates of like 40%, NIH, it was low. We started producing these curves. We, you know, we published this in BMJ. Percentage of studies published, time from study completion. You know, we're sort of topping out here at about 65%. But, but the other thing is time. We started reali realizing about the scientific lit, uh, enterprise. This again gets to Brian's talk about preprints. So if you've, got, if you've done an experiment, tell me how important it is if you don't care it takes two years to actually get it published from the time the time you're done. I mean, if, if you don't feel any time urgency, I don't know, like how important is the finding? And, and again, I'm talking about medicine now, where, you know, if Dicecape wants to take five years thinking he's figured out how to unlock the secrets of the universe, like, he, he should take his time and like that's, it, it, you know, it, because it should be beautiful when he's done and, and, and elegant. For us, it's like, if we've got information that can save lives, that can inform choices in medicine, I mean, we've got a We've got an imperative to kind of get that stuff out. But, but look where you are here. I mean, this is 20 months. And, you know, we're under 30%. You know, 40 months. I mean, these are, these are huge, uh, huge numbers. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you. It's publication report and clinical trial results across academic medical centers. First started thinking about this, started saying that this is a problem in industry. Then we started saying, uh, it was writ large, and we started talking to deans. We went to the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, and said, hey, we ought to hold hands and solve this problem. And they looked at me like, why? You know, and they're like, there's a lot to do here, you know, already, and we don't, you know, we don't want to put pressure on the medical schools to do more, and, and we're saying, but, but these are, I want to be clear about these. These are clinical trials in, in clinicaltrials.gov, that were completed, and we're asking within two years, what percent of them are published? Human experiments that are sort of funding. We're in the, the best place is University of Minnesota at about 55%. But you can say whatever you want about this, but it's all about the same. I mean, there are a few here at the end. University of Nebraska is really lagging. But but I mean, Yale's here, but I mean, we got nothing to brag about. We're under 50%. So, I mean, I, we published this in BMJ. I mean, I, I would have thought this is a national outrage. I mean, these are uh, many of the public institutions. They're all institutions that are taking federal dollars. They're experimenting on people, and they're not telling anyone. And I want to just say something about this word, publication and reporting. Publication reporting. What did that mean to us? We said, so the clinicaltrials.gov now has a place where you can report results. So it takes about 10 minutes. You go on the site, you say this, my, they're not asking for anything fancy. What was the, you had an experiment, you registered it, what was the main finding? So these rates represent, they neither reported nor published. So because some people tell me about the publishing, well, I, maybe I tried to publish, it was hard to publish. I, I kept getting rejected. It's not my fault. Well, <laughs> I ask, how good is your research if two years later you can't get the experiment on people published? I mean, that's a big problem. And, you know, by the way, we did a study on NIH. The NIH, this is about the same rate of the NIH funding. So of people getting NIH grants to do experiments on people, only about half of them were publishing or reporting the results within two years. So this is very consistent with that. But I mean, we were kind of saying, gee, no one's, none of the academic institutions are reacting, so let's do a report card on the academic institutions. Still haven't gotten much reaction. And, and finally got NIH to implement the, these guidelines that they articulated last year. This article helped push that to say, 
we're going to start saying to institutions. But what I want them to say to institutions is, if you're in non-compliance within a year, you haven't reported or published the result, we're going to pull NIH funding from the whole institution. I mean, there's just no excuse when it's that easy to say you're not reporting. I mean, this is the lowest bar possible. This doesn't get to anything Brian's doing. This is, I mean, in the sense that th that's an aspiration for much more. This is about, are you telling anyone what you found? Because it's corrupting the entire scientific literature. And uh, that's why I say guidelines, everything, I mean, are only based on part of the picture. And, and by the way, if you're going to tell me it doesn't matter because these 50% never deserve to be published, that they're, they're, they're no good, they shouldn't influence anything, we're lucky that we're not seeing them, then I'm telling you that we've got a whole lot of inefficiency in the healthcare system. And we're placing a lot of patients at potential risk for no reason at all. Because I guarantee you that a good proportion of these are, are studies that involve some risk. And so we've got to rethink that. If, you, if someone wants to make that argument, then you want to say, we're just wasting money, time, and we're putting people at risk needlessly. Um, so in the, the issue, this is, as, could we at least acknowledge that's, that the published data from, uh, that the, <laughs> That the missing published that the published data forms a classic bell curve when swept under the rug, which essentially means things are missing at random. And you know there have been some studies of this. This is one that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This guy had access to data that was at the FDA, so he looked at all the trials for a particular drug. Um, in this case, he's looking at an antidepressant, and he says, uh, "What percent of the published literature?" Uh, agreed with the FDA decision and didn't agree. And, and uh, rather than go through all this, I'll tell you the bottom line of this was that the unpublished stuff was mostly against the drug, were negative studies. Those were much more likely to be swept under the rug. So the, the premise of this article was it's not missing at random. The, the stuff that's missing is directional. And that's why we've got a bias. And it makes sense, but he, he had access to all of the data. You've seen this Turner article, I'm sure, many times. It's like you know, it's just he had access to that. But every time we've seen this, and it makes sense, well, I mean, it's not going to be missing by, ch you know, at random. It's missing in a directional way. Um, I'm just going to go through sort of what happened with clinicaltrials.gov, but I, I just kind of want to go a little faster. There, there is in this issue about even with clinicaltrials.gov, a lot of people are registering late. So why is late bad? Because you've already started the study, the res maybe even the results are coming in or you're learning something. The whole point about this is pre-specification. What are you going to do so what we can see at the end, did you do what you, were, you said you were going to do? Or were you starting to change what you're looking at based on what, what the results were? Um, I'm just going to, I know we're kind of um, running late here. And, and you know, actually the, the there, there, when they put this results reporting in clinicaltrials.gov, the idea was that people could have a quick way to let people know what the findings were, even as they were waiting for the publication. But studies after study are saying people aren't doing it. They're not taking advantage of it. So even though it's, it's mandated, it's not happening. That's part of what the NIH is also starting to put into place. But industry, if anything, does is doing better than everyone else. And I think most investigators aren't even tuned into this. And it, it's sort of like, if you're not reporting results after a year that you finished, there's something wrong. I mean, there's something wrong. And, and, uh, but, but overall, this is really um, and so, so what we were trying to do, I'd say what our contribution was, that we start thinking, I, I don't know, I mean, we're kind of like uh, one one hundredth of what Brian's done. You know, we start thinking like, well, there needs to be some solutions. What could we at least contribute to this? It's, it's not enough that we're continuing to write papers that are describing the problem. We need to try to think about some solution. So we started writing uh, you know, papers about data sharing, and we started looking for an opportunity to try to create a platform that would promote it. So the story goes something like this. You know, I, I saw that Medtronic was getting in trouble with one of its devices. There was a, 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 the spine, a group of spine surgeons we're beginning to question the safety of a very popular, very high, high, highly sold device uh, for back surgery. And, and we went to Medtronic and we said, here could be an opportunity for you. If you really believe that, you've, that they're misinterpreting the data, 
why don't we just release your data? And you know, Medtronic was sort of in a position where they were preparing to, to defend the complaints and to continue to sort of parry it and do their usual PR stuff. And I think that we sort of prevailed on them to say, why not make a partnership with us and let us release the data? And we actually said, if you're worried, let's do it like this. Give us the data. We'll contract with two of the most prominent uh, systematic review groups in the, in the world. We'll give them the data. Let them do their report, of their analysis and interpretation of the data. We'll do two because we believe that it's necessary to have two groups look, and we'll see about their concordance. By the way, they didn't exactly agree either. That's another paper we've just submitted, which is trying to show that these two world-famous groups, given the same data and the same charge and the same budget, actually come up with a little different conclusions. They were both published side by side in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And then we, then we made the data available broadly. And, and we, we said to people, as we were getting paid by Medtronic, but we had these two independent groups, but we were still paying them to do analysis. And then we said, but if anyone doesn't believe it, we're giving the data away. So you can do it, repeat it yourself. And, and what we're trying to do is to set this up so that anybody could take a look at this. And, and uh, I'm going to just, so it ended up, we, we ended up sort of creating this, the Yoda project, the Yale Open Data Access Project, which was a platform to try to um, enable people, we thought about industry, but also others, to be able to ha have a way for their data to be shared, in, in, but it was still attended to the concern of the data holders. And the kind of concerns of data holders that we wanted to attend to were, they wanted to make sure that these were research questions that were being asked, that particularly industry, not litigation, not um, com commercial, not competitors, although those lawyers and competitors could put in proposals, but that, that wouldn't have been the, uh, ostensibly the prime motivation for it. We would evaluate there was science, we'd help work with the people. In transparency, we would post the, the request and we would require people to report their results. And, uh, but, and then we would give them access to the data. And on our side, what was important to us was we were totally independent. Our contract with the companies had to say, we had full decision-making power over who got access to the data, and they knew that we, our stance was we wanted everyone to have access. That was, we didn't want to be a barrier. And so actually, we haven't denied anyone. There have been a few that we passed back because we said, this an it's a difficult to understand proposal, and you need to work on it a little bit, but not because we were judging the science to be bad as much as they were having trouble articulating exactly even what they were doing. So we, we need, we were willing to work with them, but we were trying to help them to figure out what it was that they wanted to do. But, so we created this as, as a way. We start with, with Medtronic. Medtronic actually peels off it after two years, but we were able to enlist Johnson & Johnson, and Johnson & Johnson basically told us they were committed to sharing all their trials. They're the largest drug and device company in the world. All of their uh, drug uh, trials, all of their device trials, which was unprecedented, and actually their consumer products. So. Um, Tylenol, Listerine, <laughs> anything you're interested in. And we have 180 of the trials now on the Yale site. And actually, uh, for anyone listening, I've always felt that at Yale, it's an underutilized resource. We have 180 trials that anybody here could request access to to answer a scientific question. And uh, then you would get, it's in, held in a SAS enclave would you be given permission to use it? We have the metadata about the trials, and uh, they're de the data is de-identified, and anyone can uh, can make use of it. And we um, there have been many groups that have looked at this. Let's see, I wanted to. So, and since we've started doing this, a lot of the other places have have start. The industry's been way ahead of academics in doing this, um, particularly GSK. But I think that, um, just to be clear, it's not our data. So we're an independent third party without interest, removing perception of influence over access. We have full jurisdiction to make the decisions. And, and we actually used public comment to form our approach. We wanted to see what people said, what they thought was going to be important. If you go on our site, you'll see categories of trials. You can go into any of them. There's a lot of information about it. And then you, you, we, we try to approve requests as quickly as we can. And um, all we ask, investigator name, affiliation, co-investigators, 
Research proposal, including background study design, main outcome, statistical analysis plan, and a COI statement. But all of it's for really transparency and disclosure. And we don't dig deep to start to, it's not an NIH application where we're trying to re reject anyone. We're just trying to, to do this. And once they're approved, people sign a DUA. Like I said, they gain access via mainframe. And uh, it just basically prevents distribution and makes sure that we're protecting patient privacy. The number of requests has been relatively modest. I mean, we're out here and we have had 55 requests total. And uh, so we still, th we think that the principal issue here and the criticism we're getting is all this work is being spent on, on open data access, but not many people are making use of it. So is there really the demand? And we think we're still early in this, that people are still getting used to the idea that they can do this, that even as we've tried to publicize this, I don't think enough people know about the resource. And um, we're still deeply committed to the idea that this is going to yield important studies. We've had our first couple publications from the data sharing. We think we'll, I mean, we presumably will see a lot more. And uh, we're eager to sort of see. If you go on our site, you can see we have public reporting of approved requests, submitted proposals. This is interesting. Some of the investigators have been concerned that we're sharing their request, that this is, they've got the secret to the universe, which they should share with Dice K, but the, they, that, you know, and that this is somehow preempting their, their work. You know, we believe that, again, this is an opportunity for people to both maybe to collaborate and, and uh, to see what's going on. We do try to respect uh, concerns, but we tell them we think we need, we need to go. And uh, so our goals, I think, going forward to facilitate greater access to clinical trial data, increase transparency while accelerating generation of new knowledge, Rep and at the same time promoting responsible conduct of research. Our whole thing about getting people to fill it out and post it, we believe strongly in this idea of pre-specification. Even if you're doing exploratory analysis, this is the point I brought up earlier, it's okay to do exploratory analysis. Just say, that's what you're doing. And so we think we can contribute to that. The whole goal is better inform patients, clinicians, and industry. So decisions can be based on the most comprehensive and contemporary evidence available relevant to benefits and harms of therapy. People can now go on our site and see all the trials that Johnson Johnson did, published or unpublished, They'll, that you can see them. And people can make the choices for themselves. So uh, we, we like the Yoda theme, you know, try not, do or do not, there's no try. The, I think the, the point, I don't understand what that means, but the, <laughs> but, but the point is, I think for us in academia, the responsibility is not just to describe problems, but try to solve problems. And in this case, if we think that there are, are approaches, we should experiment, we should try them. And one of my hopes, uh, I think, is that at Yale, we can begin to get more of the faculty interested in trying to set an example about what uh, good science looks like. Not just good science in terms of publication in high profile places and lots of publicity, but good science in terms of the way it's done, the, the, the workings, how we teach our students about what that is, what's the ethos that we have, and, and how we can uh, reflect a lot more people like Aaron, who maybe are going to say that this is about a social good and that we need to have a, a, a sort of spirit here that we're trying to be open and transparent and we want others to join us in, and we think that's in everyone's best interest. So thank you very much. Take some questions for Harlan. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question: Do you uh, do you see the setup you have right now for Yoda as eventually being um, unnecessary? So, is there going to be a point where the data could just be released, um, or do you foresee always having uh, an intermediary, someone who makes an approve? I think it's a really good question. I, we, we have, I think, taken the position that we should not be thinking about our self-perpetuation as being one of our goals. Now, but we, we do think we still fill an important purpose. And the, the question will be whether this will all come together because what people actually want to do is be able to combine trials across companies, too. And so right now, J&J &J will have their stuff in an enclave. GSK has their stuff in an enclave. I mean, the question will be, what, can we start to create an omnibus system so that if I'm pulling a trial from three different companies, I can actually have a place to put them, and they're all permitting that kind of co combo. I will tell you, J&J &J is open to that now, but it, it, it's not optimal that 
Yoda exists and several others exist. What we do think that the independence is important. And when the companies are kind of hiring the people and they're their consultants who are deciding who gets access, that's not ideal. We have requested data from some of the others. And it's a more cumbersome process than what we've got. And I think if, we, if they can move in that direction, and academia can move, maybe we can find some other form. Maybe Yoda goes away. And it, you know, it's, not, it's not our vision that it has to be the solution. What we were trying to do is say that there are certain properties of what Yoda has that whatever the fi you know, we get to finally should probably be part of that process. We're happy to serve the purpose. But again, you know, being in, the in, in an institution, um, we've also got some limitations as well. Maybe that maybe it should, you know, become part of the Center for Open Science or something. I mean, maybe there's another place where it ultimately sits that becomes kind of an independent place for it. I don't know. Everyone's tired at the end of the day. It's okay. Uh, there's one sense in which the data you present is completely terrifying about what isn't being done with open science and medicine. But there's another sense where it seems to me the, the breadth of work that you've done is a illustration of victory of open science. Because just you know one example, the rates of uh, reporting studies that have been completed after 24 months, there is no way to do that study in preclinical or basic sciences. It's just not possible to do it. We have no idea what studies have been done. There is no registry of what studies are being done. So th there, t there is a lot, even, even despite like, oh my God, this is a lot happening here, this seems very optimistic in that there are ways uh, to make it serviceable so that you can identify, you can do research on the process, and figure out ways to then improve it. So do you, do you see? Well, I, you, are you yeah. cynical or optimistic? About no, I'm really, I mean, we're actually, I think, uh, to have lived through this period where we first saw a problem and no one was really working on it in medicine, to a point where I've got, you know, Rob Califf as an FDA commissioner standing up and saying open science is the only way to go going forward. And Rob, Rob's kind of a convert. You know, he was running the Duke Clinical Research Institute and founded it. He's a great investigator. But, you know, Rob was one of the early people when I talked to was kind of, you know, not sure about it. And, you know, what I see now is you go to our meetings and it, you can, you, we're, it's about the edges now. You know, how many months should it be or how much time should we be given? And, and some of the trialists are still concerned about, you know, the work they've put in and what they're getting out. But, but there's a, we've moved at light speed. I mean, to be able to get this, get this from the NIH, to get what Gates is saying, which is, you know, your stuff should go up right away, to get what Picori is going to say, which is, you know, you've got to be able to report your stuff rapidly, and uh, we expect the data to be shared from high-stakes uh, funded projects. I mean, from a time when nobody was thinking like this, and it's only about 15 years, 10 or 15 years, it's uh, maybe 10 years, really. It's really remarkable change. So I think we're excited. That's why we're excited to work with you, too. I mean, we think there are other frontiers out here, but I, I think we're getting there. And I think it'll be at a point where, you know, it, it, it'll seem to be unbelievable that somebody would not be reporting their information. And that's, that's what we want. You know, we don't want to embarrass people. It's not about shaming people. But we want to create normative behaviors where that's just what's expected. And that's what we're teaching. That's what we model. That's what we do. And if you don't do it, there's something wrong, you know, and, and meaning that, you know, it's an, it's an anomaly. It's something's at issue. And, and we're getting closer. So I, I think uh, if you hear impatience in my voice, it's just because I want to see change faster. But, but in terms of progress, I, it, it's been remarkable, really remarkable. Thanks. Um, I have a, a comment about some of the non-reproducible uh, results in clinical trials, uh, many psychological, psychology experiments too. So in a lot of these experiments, uh, the variability in subjects gets reduced down to really discrete demographic variables like age and sex and race. But human biology and personality is much more complex than that. So in, in some sense, even if you are perfectly replicating results, 
and uh, you, you have appropriate power based on the variability that you're modeling for, you expect that there's maybe just a ton more random error in subjects. And so if you accept that, uh, we really have to replicate studies multiple times, uh, not to validate the results of one study, but o because only through multiple replication could you ever come at some kind of consensus given variable outcomes that yes, this is a real effect or not. So there's still room, th important room for open science and data sharing in all that, but more of an incentive actually for multiple labs to be replicating results and then come up with one consensus after those studies. Yeah, and I, I think our, our biggest challenge is the cost and time that's involved in doing any of the single studies. It's like, you, you know, it's a big mountain to climb. It, and the physicists, you know, the, the, they have the same issues, you know, the, the, they can't create, it. CERN will create something big in France, they can't create it all over the place, so they gotta do it right. For us, though, there are all these different variables. So there's two, two issues you brought up. One is about external validity. I mean, it's valid for the, if, if you do believe the results for that group, is it equally valid for older people or younger people or people in different countries or in different health systems or, or, and then there's the issue of whether or not there is actually internal validity and whether or not actually what you found in that group could be replicated again and that's really, the rela that relationship is true. And then you've got the stochastic nature of it too, which is if you did it enough times, you're gonna see some distribution of effect because it's likely not deterministic where you give everyone this and, and you give A and B happens. It's, you've increased the likelihood of A or B happening. And, and so the distance between the two groups, uh, even within the same group, is gonna be, there's gonna be some distribution of, of effect sizes that, you know, just be by chance alone. So, I mean, though, that's what makes it complicated. But I don't know, Brian, you've thought more about this than anyone, about the, the, the approach, because in a lot of these cases that aren't replicated, you're, you've actually held constant a lot of the other issues. But once you start saying, I, you know, whether it, it would, whether when you don't see it replicated in another group that represents an interaction, or it represents a non-replication of the initial study, those are those are two hypotheses, you know, that have to be further, I think, evaluated. They're both possible. Any idea? I don't know if you have anything, Brian, on that. So. Any other comments? Um. Thanks. So. Um I have a question about the um, the problem, the the platform, the um, data sharing on clinical data. So, uh, I work in VA uh, CSP, so we have done a lot of trials, and one of the um, we have discussed this as an internal discussion about um, uh, data collection uh, procedures. So, we found that most of the time, well, so for example, for um, for defining the same disease, the different ICD-9 codes, or even you define for example, hypokalemia, whether you based on lab results or some trials require you come back in t one or two weeks to confirm. In that case, a lot of details that will affect how the data is really compared, whether it's in a fair way. So I wonder when you have that data sharing uh, projects, do you have some um, plan to have, so for example, like protocols or operational manuals that will help people to really understand how the data is collected? Yeah, yeah. So this is an yeah. important point. Uh, first, it'll be great if the VA starts sharing data. You know, I don't. I, I, I've talked to the top people at the VA, and and they're philosophically aligned, but they don't share data. So that's an amazing thing. You know, the federal government pays for trials in the VA, and the VA doesn't share the data. Uh, you, they will say you can apply to okay. work with VA investigators who did this study. By the way, this is another interesting thing, Brian. You know, a, a lot of the things people are saying is, well, if you want to do sharing, you must include the investigators from the original study on it. When one of the beliefs here is you need to separate from the, the original investigators instead. And one of the things that, that I would hear a lot from established investigators were that no one could possibly use my trial because they could never understand the data like we do. And then I would say, but what about the documentation? They said, well, we made a lot of decisions that we never documented and that no one would be able to understand all of the data definitions. And, we basically just said bingo. You just said why you've got to share data because you basically just said you're unauditable. I'm not saying VA, but I'm just saying, and, and no one at the VA told me that. I'm saying at other, <laughs> other places when I've heard that, people have said that. And I said that without the self sort of uh, insight that what they've just said is actually something very terrible about the quality of the science. But, but uh, with regard to this, yeah, metadata has to accompany this. And the presumption is 
what, what our belief is going forward, if you knew your data was going to be shared, then you, you would take even more care to make sure the manuals and the documentation and everything was very clear. When, when it's not going to be shared, you, it was interesting with J&J, &J, they, they know this, it's not speaking out of school, but a lot of their trials were in very poor shape with regard to documentation. And same thing with Medtronics. A lot of the original time was spent going back and sort of retrofitting like the documentation, not, not for bias, but just definitions. Like pull, they didn't even have the stuff at their fingertips. And what we're saying is good science should mean like immediately you've got all the data definitions. Anyone on the team can get their hands on it. And if you were going to share, it's not a big deal to kind of pull this stuff together. But for some reason, we got into a habit where maybe because it was never being shared, it was kind of like internally there was a lot of communication, but that people weren't keeping up the, the documentation in a way that would make it easy. But yeah, on our site and with J&J, &J, we, we have to have all that metadata in order to make it meaningful. You can't just share the data. And that takes work, especially going back. What we want to see is going forward, people are anticipating this so that there's these standards, and this is another area to work on, like what are the standards of documentation that represent best practice for other people to be able to use what you've done or audit it. And I, those, as far as I can see, are not codified completely. But uh, yeah, it's very important. And I look to the day when VA will share their data. <laughs> well, I think that right now you can apply for the data, but the, I think some of the progress, projects I see, I think they have the... Um, like Courage Trial. You can't get your hands on the Courage Trial. The investigator's holding it so tight. And if I'm being filmed, hi, I know all of you. You're holding it so tight. <laughs> late. I want to thank you all.